Oh, good afternoon. Welcome to the first in the lecture series associated with our spring semester Master of Landscape Architecture Interdisciplinary Studio, 100 Year Coastal Resilience Studio, Hampton, Virginia. My name is Jack Leonard. And I am the instructor of this course along with Scott Naki from MSU Pearl down in Patuxent. Uh, the goal of this coordinated undertaking of faculty, students, and researchers from Morgan's School of Architecture and Planning, Morgan School of Engineering, our Pearl Labs, uh, the University of Maryland Earth System Science Interdisciplinary Center, University of Maryland Center for Environmental Science, Maryland Sea Grant Extension, and Virginia Tech School of Architecture and Design is to reframe the challenge of climate change as an opportunity for innovation, inclusion, and collaboration, and to create designs and visions for how a resilient and sustainable coastal community might look and function 100 years into the future. Our first guest lecture in the series is Ariana Sutton Greer. This evening, her topic will be coast climate change and natural hybrid infrastructure. Ariana is an ecosystem ecologist and visiting associate research professor at University of Maryland Earth System Interdisciplinary Center with expertise in wetland ecology and restoration, biodiversity, biochemistry, or bi biogeochemistry, climate change, and ecosystem services. A former Smithsonian and AAAS Science and Technology Policy Fellow, Ariana's research focuses on relations between nature, biodiversity, and human health, coastal blue carbon, and nature-based coastal resilience strategy. The author of over 45 peer-reviewed articles, she earned the PhD in ecology from Duke University and a BS honors in environmental science and international studies from Oregon State University. So please welcome our speaker, Ariana Sutton Greer. Thanks very much, Jack. And um, I'm thrilled to be here this evening. We discussed ahead of time that we will um, mostly hold questions until the end, but please do feel free to put questions in the chat and those will be collected throughout my talk um, and then we'll address them at the end. Um, but otherwise it's hard in this format to take questions right as you go. So I think we'll wait and hold questions until the very end. So again, I'm thrilled to be here and this uh, project is um, very aligned with my own research interests and, and experience uh, over the last decade plus. So let's dive in here. Uh, hang on, there we go. So uh, the US has had a few really powerful uh, hurricane seasons um, and it's really causing us to sort of rethink uh, some of what's going on in with communities on the coast. And this is an article from April, 2017. Flooding is the most common and most expensive natural disaster in the US. Um, so 2017 was our most expensive hurricane season on record um, with uh, well over two, actually I, I tried, I, um, sorry, I thought I had updated that number. Um, but it's actually almost almost three hundred billion dollars. It was two two hundred ninety billion, um, and we've had several seasons that were in the billions, um, but none quite like twenty seventeen recently. Thank goodness. Um, so it's it's really important though to think about the fact that when we have these coastal impacts, they actually have big impacts across the country. And this particular figure really had an impact on my thinking about this. So what you're seeing in this one, this, these are data from the US Department of Transportation from 2012. Um, what you can see are, are some of our major ports in the US on both the East Coast and the West Coast, as well as in the Gulf. And what you see are that products that come in through those ports then make their way across the country. Um, and so what happens at the coast actually has big impacts to all of us, no matter where we live in the US. And there was a really interesting anecdote the year that Superstorm Sandy struck that many stores in the Midwest never received their holiday merchandise because Sandy struck in late fall and um, products never had a chance to make it into the ports and then across the country the way they would normally have. So, you know, what's, what happens at the coast doesn't just stay at the coast. It's actually quite important to the whole country and to the whole country's economy. 
Now, the other thing to realize is it isn't just about the major storms anymore. We are now experiencing more nuisance flooding, which comes with more costs. So we have the cumulative cost of nuisance flooding, and th this is what we call blue skies flooding. So this is flooding that's not related to a storm. It's basically just an extra high, high tide. And the costs of nuisance flooding may actually be starting to exceed the costs of extreme events like hurricanes, which we already heard can be very, very high. So this is from data looking at Washington, D.C. in particular, um, that we used to have about 19 hours of nuisance flooding between the 1930s to the 1970s. And that's 19 hours cumulatively. So it was usually a few hours, you know, on a few days that would add up to about 19 hours. Then in the last two decades, it became closer to 94 hours. And it's predicted that by 2050, it could be as high as 700 hours a year that we would have nuisance flooding affecting um, our ability to do simple things like get to work or get our kids from school or get them to school. And that starts to just have major impacts on society as a whole. So I pulled this graphic because I know that um, some of you are focused on this project in the Hampton Roads area. And so this is looking at sea level rise specifically measured at Sewell's Point in that area. And so we've had 14 inches in sea level rise since 1950. Now I do want to make the point, and I'm going to come back to this, mostly this is due to the land sinking, so subsidence, and we'll come back to that. We'll talk a little bit more about subsidence in just a little bit. Um, but it doesn't, in some ways, it doesn't actually matter why exactly it's happening. It is happening, and the pace has actually accelerated in the last 10 years. So now it's rising about one inch every four years. Um, and so this area is second only to New Orleans in terms of the largest population and infrastructure at risk because we have major naval operations in this area as well as major population center. So, okay, let's, this is what I want to come back to. Why is sea level rise happening? And um, actually, Colleen, if it's at all possible, I'd love to have people enter what they think into the chat. And then if you could just read me some of those answers, I want to give people a chance to think about what do they know about sea level rise and why, why is this happening? Absolutely. Everybody, if you want to type your responses into the chat. We don't have any responses yet, unfortunately. No worries. Um, okay, I might have so caught people off guard. I like to make things interactive, but it is a little bit harder over Zoom. <laughs> <laughs> so we, we've got two, um, warming ocean temperatures and melting glaciers. Okay, great. So those are both really good answers, and, and those are on my list here. So we have melting ice and glaciers, um, and that's definitely happening. So we literally have more water going into the oceans than we did before. So that's helping to cause sea level rise. Then we have what's called thermal expansion. So as water warms, it gets bigger, right? This is basic chemistry in action. As we have warmer water, it takes up more volume. Um, there's a couple more reasons that are really important to think about. So subsidence is something that in this part of the country, Maryland and Virginia, we really have to think about. Now, what's really interesting about subsidence that I didn't really get is, so for example, I know mostly about this um, because of out on the Eastern shore of Maryland. Um, so when we had the last ice age, the ice didn't actually make it all the way to the Eastern shore of Maryland. So what's interesting when you have ice coming over land, I hope you can see my hands here, is that the ice is heavy. So it actually pushes down on the land where the ice is and if you can see the rest of my hand, part of the land gets pushed up when part of the land is covered in ice. Then as the ice recedes, that weight is gone and slowly the land comes back. Well, if you notice what happened to this part of my hand right here, this is like the Eastern shore of Maryland. So it was higher during the ice age where the ice was covering next to it, adjacent to it. And now it's slowly coming back. Well, that means the land is actually sinking and it's a natural geologic phenomenon Unfortunately, now it's combined with sea level rise. And so we have rates of sea level rise that are much higher than they otherwise would be because of subsidence combined with these other things. Okay, the last piece that's really interesting is we actually have evidence that there is a changing Gulf Stream as well. And I've put a, a link here in the bottom to a really interesting YouTube video uh, put out by Maryland Sea Grant that explains this uh, probably even better than I can. It's at minute 5.25, I've, I've noted here. Oh, sorry, that's not supposed to be vide, that's supposed to be video. 
So what's happening is that um, the as the as the water comes up along the east coast of the U.S. and then it's supposed to move across to Europe and it kind of does this big gyration in the Atlantic. Um, basically, uh, as that is happening, because the water is warming, you actually are having a, a lessening effect of the Gulf Stream. So you are not getting as strong a Gulf Stream circle as you used to have. So it used to be really cool air in the north and warmer water in the south, and that was driving that Gulf Stream. And that is lessening. So when we had a stronger Gulf Stream, water was being pushed towards Europe because of the turning of the earth. So water was actually being pulled offshore um, by the Gulf Stream for Maryland and Virginia and, and basically this part of our coast. That is weakening. So at the same time that we have more water, we have warmer water, so we have a greater volume of water, we have subsidence still happening, then we have a weakening Gulf Stream. So this is partly why sea level rise is such a big deal in the mid-Atlantic part of the US. Okay, so I, we've talked about sea level rise, we're not going to end up coming back to that, but I am going to talk about other climate change impacts to coasts, so we'll come back to that. But I want to first... Um, just as part of my intro here, talk about, so what do we as humans typically do when we have problems with flooding? Well, our typical response to date has usually been that we harden our shoreline. So we put in seawalls and revetments and we try to protect ourselves. Now I have a colleague, Rachel Gitman, who's a faculty member at Eastern Carolina University. She actually asked this question um, as part of her dissertation and found that there was no answer to it at the time. She said, how much of the US coast is already hardened? And she could not find that answer anywhere. So she spent a chapter of her dissertation figuring out that it's about 14% of the US coast is already hardened. However, as you can imagine, that's not evenly distributed. So in places where there are dense urban areas, it's already at 75 or even over 100% hardened. Um, and that's just because of the way that um, people are, right? We want to we be protected. The most hardening, interestingly, has been in protected bays, but that's mostly, I think, because that's where people tend to live. And so then as we're thinking about where is hardening going to happen in the future, the Gulf Coast and the South Atlantic areas are predicted to be the areas with the most coastal population growth. So if trends continue, we would assume that that's where the most hardening will happen. Okay. I wanna juxtapose that to a paper by another one of my colleagues, Katie Arkema and, and a bunch of her colleagues um, from 2013, where they looked at exposure of the US coastline and coastal populations to sea level rise in 2100. So we're looking out into the future. So I know there's a lot going on in this graphic. So let me just kind of walk you through. So first look at the different colors along the coast. So blue means there's the least coastal hazard um, that we're facing with, with, uh, with sea level rise. So less chance of, of flooding. Yellow is intermediate and red is high. And so if you look at the Chesapeake Bay area on the right there, you can see that a lot of the bay is either red or yellow. So we have um, you know, basically a high level of risk to um, sea level rise and having that impact our population. Now, what I wanna draw your attention to next is the, are the bars in the middle of the United States there. So what you're seeing are all of the coastal states along the x-axis there. And then you're seeing population in thousands along the y-axis. In the black bars, so look at the black bars first, you're looking at how many people in these areas are currently threatened basically while we still have in place a bunch of our coastal habitats. And yet we know that those coastal habitats are at risk from development, eutrophication, other, other basically uh, environmental human challenges. So the white bars show you how many people are at risk in these areas if we lose those coastal habitats. And so if you look, uh, basically there's, a, there's an increase in all cases, but some states are particularly pronounced like New York and Florida. California, but also look at Maryland, our bars are much smaller, and Virginia, our bars are again smaller. But basically the population at risk actually comes, comes close to doubling, or in some cases more than doubles, if we lose those coastal habitats. So that's one of the main things I want to talk to you guys about today is the importance of what we might call natural infrastructure, what these ecosystems are providing in the way of protection for people and property 
uh, where they exist, and also the potential for doing restoration or implementing other strategies to bring more of this natural protection to our coastlines. So that was my intro. Uh, here's my here's my overview. So so the work I do is really science to try to support ecosystem management and decision making. Today we're going to cover two topics. So I want to do really briefly a little bit more on climate change impacts on coasts because I know this is the first uh, talk you're really getting on this, and I kind of just want to do a big overview. Although we're we're going to kind of just graze the surface on this, then we're going to spend more time on this natural and hybrid infrastructure for coastal resilience piece. So that's our roadmap moving forward. All right. So this part about climate change impacts on coasts actually comes from a paper that I'm, um, I know you were provided. It was by a colleague of mine, Paul Sandifer, and I wrote a paper in 2014. Now we actually looked at the time at five stressors and we were connecting these stressors on coastal ecosystems to the changes they're having on those coastal ecosystems and then all the way to how that affects human health. I'm gonna focus a little bit less on the human health piece today, and I'm not gonna cover all five stressors. They're not all related to climate change, although I will say there are synergies with climate change. So for example, we're not gonna really talk about nutrient pollution, but harmful algal blooms and hypoxia tend to be exacerbated by climate change. So there's still a link there. But what we're gonna look at are rising temperatures, ocean acidification and extreme weather events. Now, just remember we've already covered sea level rise to some degree. So we already know that's a factor happening with climate change. Here are three more things we wanna talk about related to coasts and climate change. So rising temperatures first. There's some um, interesting work happening here, uh, looking at how we are changing our coastal environment by warming the oceans, which is leading to changes in oxygen in the water. And the, so the changes in both oxygen and temperature are then leading to changes in distribution and phenology and productivity of our fisheries. So we have evidence, for example, that with less dissolved oxygen in the, in the warmer water, average body size of fish is actually going down. And by 2050, it may be quite noticeable. And then you're also seeing that populations that used to be closer to the tropics are able to move north. They're shifting north because waters are warmer. So we're having changes potentially in community structure and which species are present. And we might actually be having changes in the physiology of these organisms such that fisheries in the future may not be able to grow as big a fish because of the reduced oxygen in the water. Okay, so temperature and corals. We know that as waters rise to a certain point, um, corals get stressed. So if you, so on the left here, you have healthy corals and corals right have a, a symbiotic relationship with algae. They depend on each other to survive. When you stress a coral with really hot water, the algae actually leaves the coral. And this then what's left behind um, is a much weaker coral because again, they're symbiotic and, um, and they tend to bleach. And uh, in many cases, they can potentially still recover, but it takes a very long time um, or it can take a very long time. So here's an example of the Great Barrier Reef bleached. Uh, here's American Samoa. You see a timeline where they had a very strong bleaching event. Um, and so you had healthy in December of 2014. Here it was dying in February of 2015 and then fully dead by August of 2015. So these are the kinds of effects we can expect with really intense heat waves in the ocean. Um, and, then, and then here was, I, I said, I'm not gonna talk too much about human health, but I think this piece is really, really interesting. So as we have these rising temperatures and we have warmer and warmer water in places we haven't had it before, we actually are seeing diseases we've never seen um, in other places. We're, we're finding them in new places. So for example, Vibrios are a bacteria that cause illness, and uh, this is oftentimes what's causing seafood poisoning. We've actually had some of our first outbreaks in Alaska now, which was a massive uh, expansion of range that we had not had before. You did not used to have to worry about Vibrios in Alaska because the water was simply too cold. Um, so what we're finding is that there really is this increase in Vibrio cases, and it's been able to be correlated with temperature. So as we have warming waters, we have more risk that we can get seafood poisoning due to Vibrios. So again, lots of changes in our coastal environment due simply to the temperature change that we're experiencing with, with climate change. All right. 
So then there's the other component of climate change that's affecting our oceans, which is ocean acidification. So this is really, again, basic chemistry. When you dissolve carbon dioxide from the atmosphere in the ocean, and right, the ocean and the atmosphere are going to try to be in equilibrium. So the more CO2 you put into the atmosphere, the more is then going to dissolve into the ocean because those two systems are going to work to be in equilibrium. Again, this is just basic chemistry. Um, so as we dissolve CO2 into the ocean, CO2 plus water forms carbonic acid. And so you automatically get H2CO3, which then dissolves in water into bicarbonate and a hydrogen ion. So this is your basic process that is occurring to cause the oceans to become more acidic. And I just really like this graphic because it's nice and basic. So um, this does have human health impacts as well as affecting the, the animals out there. So the ocean's already about 30% more acidic than at pre-industrial levels. So we already talked about the effects this can have on corals and other calcifying coral reef organisms, um, also on other calcifying organisms like oysters and mussels. So this actually has really important effects on reef associated fisheries. So if you have a fish you're harvesting that's dependent on healthy coral reefs, the reefs are now in danger both from increased temperatures and from ocean acidification. Um, also, interestingly, we eat a bunch of mollusks. Um, so this is where I'm talking about shellfish that's of interest. And shellfish have a much harder time forming their shells, particularly at a really young stage in a, in a more um, heavily acidic ocean. And so one example of this is from the Pacific Northwest. Um, and so major economic impacts are possible. This has been a highly talked about example because Northwest oyster farmers started noticing that they were approaching a huge hatchery collapse. They weren't able to grow any of the tiny oyster spat that they normally grow in the hatcheries along the coast. And then they put out in the ocean and they grow and then they harvest them. And they, they had basically a year where nothing grew. And so there's been a bunch of research invested in this and they basically discovered that the ocean water they were pumping into their hatcheries was too acidic to grow the little tiny oysters. And so it's a huge success for science in terms of understanding what was going wrong. The solution right now is for them to turn off the ocean water when it gets too acidic, when the upwelling bottom water comes up and it's too acidic. Um, and so then they have to, but then they have to pipe in other water. They have to pipe in fresh water that they turn into seawater by adding salts. And that can allow the hatchery to persist. But you can see that this isn't necessarily a really long-term sustainable solution um, because uh, what we're really talking about are ocean conditions that are now not very um, conducive to growing oysters. So they're making it work right now, but you can see that as the oceans potentially cont continue to acidify, there could be more and more times in the year when the conditions in the ocean are not conducive to growing oysters. And this is a huge industry in the Pacific Northwest. So we've got sea level rise, we've got rising temperatures. Now we've got ocean acidification. These are all impacts of climate change on our coasts and oceans. The last one I wanna talk about is extreme weather. We're gonna cover this pretty briefly, but there is a lot of effort to try to better understand how is climate change affecting weather and how much of the storms we're experiencing are due to climate change. There have been a couple of really recent studies that are suggesting that um, storms are getting stronger because of climate change. There's more energy in the atmosphere, which means storms are just stronger. There's more power there. Um, they're also getting closer to the coast. This one literally came out a couple of weeks ago in science. Um, so these storms that used to hang out in the Atlantic, for example, or in the Gulf, a little bit farther away from the coastlines are now getting, they, they estimated 30 kilometers closer to the coast. And that means they bring even more intense um, wind and water even closer to our coast, creating, for example, what happened in Hurricane Harvey in Texas, where the storm came in and just sat over Texas for multiple days, causing massive amounts of flooding because there was no place for all this water to go. So this means that we are likely to be experiencing increased storm damages, loss of property and life. And then, of course, you have issues with when you have cities that flood and you have um, things like municipal sewage that gets into the waterways or other chemicals from chemical plants or other industry along the coast that gets into the water, then you have problems with contaminated seafood potentially. So there's just all sorts of ramifications of these extreme weather events in our coastal communities. 
Okay, I recognize that's a very cheerful subject. Um, it's not really. Uh, but that's why we're going to turn now to some of the work I've done trying to look at, okay, so what are our options here? What, what can we potentially be doing to make our coastal communities more resilient in the face of all of these climate change impacts? Now, I'll just pause long enough to say it's really important we tackle climate change, right? We've got to be reducing the amount of CO2 in the atmosphere. We've got to tackle this all solutions on the table. Um, I'm not going to talk about it today, but some of the work I do is also on coastal blue carbon. This is the uh, carbon that's taken up and stored by coastal wetlands. They are one piece, one natural climate solution, and one part of our climate solution potentially, but we need all solutions on the table because we have got to slow this problem down. But I'll get off my soapbox now. That's the end of that for right now. We can talk about it more later if you want. This is, we're talking about resilience. We're talking about adaptation. So climate change is already upon us. It's happening. We might be able to slow it, but it's gonna continue to happen. What can we be doing in our coastal communities? So I think that Superstorm Sandy was actually a really important turning point in the way we think about our coastal communities um, and in the way we think about resilience. And so this, this has, it, there, there is a silver lining to all of the devastation that Superstorm Sandy caused. So it used to be that when we talked about coastal resilience, you almost never heard anything more than about the gray or built infrastructure. So we would talk about seawalls and riprap, uh, levees, dikes, all of the different strategies we have, which I'm gonna term gray or built infrastructure. And don't get me wrong, we're probably always gonna have a need for some of this. this these aren't going away. But what's really exciting is that we're now also talking about what's the role of natural infrastructure? What role can these ecosystems play? And are there spaces in which we can use natural infrastructure to build that resilience? So when I say natural infrastructure, I'm talking about things like salt marshes and mangroves or coral and oyster reefs or beaches, dunes and barrier islands. So those are the things we're gonna call natural or green infrastructure. So how does this work? How do these systems help? Um, this is a really nice figure put together by the Nature Conservancy. So what you're seeing here is waves coming in from the ocean on the left. And as they go over an oyster reef, some of the energy reduces. And then as they have to make their way through that tidal marsh, some of the wave energy reduces such that by the time it gets to the shore, it's a much more uh, uh, moderate and manageable amount of wave energy. So the problem, of course, is as we lose these habitats, for whatever reason, in the case of oyster reefs, we over harvested a lot of our oyster reefs. We also created water quality problems that meant that oysters were having a hard time surviving because there was too much sediment and pollution in the water. Um, with tidal marshes, they may be losing ground due to sea level rise. We also may have destroyed them by uh, deciding to farm them or build houses and resorts and hotels on them, right? So for whatever reason, in this bottom picture, we've lost our natural ecosystems. And what you can see is that that wave energy just makes its way all the way to shore with basically no reduction in wave energy and wave height. So the role of natural infrastructure is to slow those waves and to reduce the height and the energy that those waves are bringing with them. So this is a really cool study um, from 2014 where they actually took chunks of salt marsh and moved them into a huge flume. And then they started pounding this marsh with waves. So in the top picture, you see that, that vegetation is starting to bend over under the wave energy. And by the bottom picture, that vegetation is almost completely flat because it's getting hammered by really big waves. And so this was one of the first studies to really try to quantify what happens when a big storm impacts a salt marsh. And what they found is that up to 60% of the wave energy reduction was attributed to the vegetation. So the vegetation is really important. Once that vegetation breaks, you won't necessarily have the same amount of wave reduction, which makes a lot of sense. However, interestingly, they found that the marsh substrate, so the soil surface, remained stable under all conditions, even once waves had broken the stems of the plants. So in terms of preventing erosion and further loss of land uh, along our coasts, this vegetation played a key part in stabilizing that shoreline, even once it could no longer reduce the wave energy. And so they concluded salt marsh ecosystems can be a valuable component of coastal protection schemes. And again, this was really um, earth shattering science, if you will, at the time. It's why it made it into nature geoscience, I'm sure, because nobody had really asked these questions and measured what happens as these waves hit these marshes in this kind of really particular way. So I was asked by my leadership when I was working at the National Ocean Service at NOAA 
to actually come up with the state of the science on what do we know about how these ecosystems provide wave attenuation and, and risk reduction. And so, um, and, and there's been some additional studies since this time, but, but uh, and our knowledge base is definitely growing, but we were able to determine, my, my team and I, that there are many factors that influence the amount of coastal protection provided. So the first factor is the amount of habitat. The more habitat you have, the more wave reduction you're going to get. And it actually matters how intact that habitat is. So if that's if the habitat is very naturally healthy and still very intact, it's going to provide more protection than if we have run roads or pipelines or train tracks through these ecosystems. If we have put a road right through that ecosystem or a pipeline, that becomes a conduit into which the waves can start to go move up into the wetland and erode away at the edges. And you start to weaken the ecosystem with every, every time you chop it up into a smaller piece, essentially. So you want to know how much of an ecosystem do you have and how contiguous is it? How, how, um, how uninterrupted, basically. Now, another factor that matters if you're a vegetated ecosystem is the density of vegetation. How dense is that vegetation? Because the denser the vegetation, the more wave energy reduction you're going to get. And then if you're a reef system, coral or oyster, the most energy is lost as the waves go over the reef crest, the very front edge of the reef, which tends to usually be the highest part. And that's where the majority of the wave energy is lost. So the height of that reef crest is a really important factor in how much energy reduction you're gonna have. Okay, so, so what does natural infrastructure look like here then? So here's an example of a community that maybe has said, we want more protection next time there's a storm. What could we do? And they may have a salt marsh that's existent. They say, okay, we're gonna protect that salt marsh. We're gonna make sure that nothing happens to it. We're gonna keep it as healthy as possible. They might be remembering that they used to have a whole lot of oyster reefs. Maybe they're gonna try and restore oyster reefs. And then also they might have a barrier island that maybe got breached by the last storm. And they're saying, well, we're gonna, we're gonna restore that barrier island. And the neat thing about natural infrastructure is you can layer your approaches just like that. You can have more than one approach. You can talk about all different kinds of natural infrastructure and each one is going to provide some wave, uh, wave energy reduction and help protect what's behind it. So some of the benefits of using natural infrastructure instead of built infrastructure like a seawall is that these systems can actually strengthen with time. And in fact, if you're putting in a brand new ecosystem or if you're restoring a system, these systems will be the weakest the day you walk away saying, well, we completed the restoration or we've planted all the plants and now they have to grow. As those plants grow and establish, they will, that system will strengthen with time. These systems can also be self-maintaining and they have the potential for self-repair after storms. You can't say that about built infrastructure. These systems in some cases can grow and keep pace with sea level rise um, and they can be more cost-effective to build. And then the last thing that I think is really important to recognize is that these systems provide all kinds of what we call co-benefits, other benefits that are unrelated to storm risk reduction. And they provide those all the time. So what do I mean when I say co-benefits? We're talking about things like they provide really important fishery habitat that can support recreational and commercial fisheries. In the case of coastal wetlands, they provide really important carbon storage so they're a climate mitigation opportunity. They provide recreation and tourism opportunities. They provide water filtration so they're helping to clean our coastal water. They provide cultural services like educational opportunities, research opportunities. They also provide habitat for other key species like migratory birds. So you're getting all of these additional benefits all the time. Whereas built infrastructure like a seawall only provides the storm protection benefit when a storm is approaching. So let me come to a little bit about how, what do we know now about how important these systems are for their economic benefits? So there's a couple of studies here, but we definitely could use more. Um, one study suggested that US coastal wetlands provide $23 billion worth of storm protection every year. After the Superstorm Sandy storm, a colleague of mine, Sid Narian, and his colleagues were able to uh, determine that wetlands helped avoid $625 million in flood damages in Superstorm Sandy alone. So we do know these systems have economic value. 
Now, as I was doing the work on the natural infrastructure, what also came up that was new for me was this concept of a hybrid approach where you combine green and gray. So looking here at this picture, this is another similar community to the one we just looked at. But in this case, they're, they're using some other methods in addition to the layered natural infrastructure. For example, they are moving some houses away from the shoreline. They are putting some houses up on stilts so they're better able to handle flooding. They've installed a seawall with an operable floodgate that will close as necessary to help prevent flooding. So this is one example, I'm gonna go through others, so don't worry, but one example of that hybrid approach where you're combining green and gray. And what's so cool about the hybrid approach is that you can really combine the strengths of green and gray. You can sometimes use gray infrastructure to protect your green as it's establishing if you're doing something brand new. Um, because the green will be weakest as you just establish it. But, you, but actually what I see most often is that the green is used to protect the gray, which helps to either extend the lifetime of that gray infrastructure, but it also sometimes means you can build less gray infrastructure because you've got the green infrastructure already creating some wave attenuation and risk reduction. And so this can help reduce costs of a project. So for example, you wouldn't have to build as big a seawall if there's some green infrastructure in front of it helping to reduce wave energy. So, so there are lots of examples of hybrid um, examples and I, and I wanna give you several. So this is an example of a living shoreline. In the top picture, this is actually NOAA property in North Carolina on Pivers Island. And that beach you see in front there was eroding. And so they determined they wanted to put in a living shoreline which you see in the bottom picture. So they actually had enough oyster shell on site to be able to do a, a sill, an edge of oyster shell that you can't really see because it's under the water in the picture. And then they were able to put in that buffer strip of marsh vegetation such that this shoreline is no longer eroding. So this is one example of a living shoreline, again, in North Carolina. Now I have some pictures here of Maryland living shorelines that I have gotten to visit. So Maryland uh, has been a state along with a few others that have really been experimenting with living shorelines. Um, and one of the things Maryland really sought to do was to say, can we use living shorelines even in areas with pretty high wave energy? You can see the long fetch here looking out into the bay. When wave comes across that, that, that a stretch of water, it can really build up some serious waves. So that's a very long stretch. And this is a fairly highly active wave energy site. And the, the thinking prior to some of these experiments in Maryland and elsewhere was that you could never put a living shoreline in this kind of a setting. And yet what they've determined is as long as they build in the, the rock weirs that are big enough to help handle some of that wave energy behind those rock weirs, they can still put in living shoreline vegetation. And this site has been extremely successful, which you can't see is just to the left of my picture are very, very expensive houses in the Bay that were very close to having their, their shoreline erode right out from under them. So this has been a really successful project for stabilizing the shoreline. And again, using that hybrid approach, some built components and some more natural components. Here's another example. Uh, it's really hard to tell from the picture, but they're using what they call the, the claw um, idea. So you've got a, a loop of vegetation that sticks out on either side to help slow the waves entering into the little bay. Um, and they're experimenting with some other shapes. This one was called a whale's tail. Um, and then here they're even planning for what is it gonna look like in another 50 to 100 years with sea level rise occurring. So they're really starting to be very forward thinking in their living shoreline designs. Um, and I think this is really exciting because it's starting to show that we can use this hybrid approach in a lot of different scenarios, not just really low wave energy sites, which is what the, the going thinking was a few years ago. Okay, so if you guys haven't had a chance to take a look at the Rebuild by Design website, I would spend some time there because I think there's a ton of really cool innovative ideas here and I'm gonna show you a couple of my favorites. So Rebuild by Design was a competition that occurred post Superstorm Sandy in the New York, New Jersey area. Communities were able to come together and come up with an idea for what they wanted to do to make themselves more resilient in the future. And so this is a very urban waterfront environment where they re-envisioned the area to be a really great recreational space for people when it's not stormy, but then also a space that's gonna absorb a lot of flood water naturally if they have another big storm. So we've got permeable pavement 
We've got a bioswale, then we've got a bioretention area. And then behind that, all the way in the background, we have a created wetland. And so again, you've got that layering idea, multiple layers of things that are gonna help to absorb and slow any wave energy that's coming into this part of the community, right? But the rest of the time, it's a really wonderful outdoor recreational area and providing at least a little bit of habitat. Um, so this is one creative idea that can be done in a very urban setting. Um, this, is a, this is one of my very favorite projects, the Big U Project, um, which is on the island of Manhattan, so very built up. You can see some of the pictures of what they envisioned here in their uh, initial uh, project. This was one of the winners of the Rebuild by Design contest. So they envisioned both hard and soft infrastructure, again, with recreational benefits, because what they learned from the Manhattan community when they started talking to them about what they wanted was that they this community actually wanted to feel more connected to the waterfront. Um, they wanted to enjoy the benefit of being close to the water, and yet it was very hard to get to the water in a lot of parts of Manhattan. So they're talking about integrating the flood protection into the community while improving water access. So here's a picture of their first, first part of the first piece of this project where they're doing the East Side Resilience Project. And um, I love this, this picture. I have two back, back to back to show you. So this is kind of what they envision it looking like on a blue sky day, no storm day, right? And again, a really lovely recreational area with some of that natural infrastructure and some place that somebody would want to come and walk along the water. But then watch the background here. Here it's raining and you can see a giant wall has slid into place to block flooding from making it farther into uh, downtown Manhattan. And now this area along the coast is ready to be flooded if needed for a few days until the storm uh, surge abates. So this is what they're working on right now in New York City. Um, there were some, again, for some additional inspiration, I would look at that Rebuild by Design site. There were some really cool articles that came out, again, post Sandy. The one on the left shows just trying to restore a ton of the oyster reefs that we used to have in New York City Harbor. And all of those would be helping to slow waves as they were headed towards the city, right? Um, and then this idea of some floating wetlands mixed in, it's all very creative and very exciting. Um, and it would come with a lot of other benefits like benefits to fisheries and to recreational opportunities, et cetera. So it's, it's really in one of those win-win kind of opportunities. So check out, check out the New York Times story and some of those other opportunities if you wanna get really excited, at least I get excited about this stuff. All right, so one of the questions I get asked is, do these hybrid solutions work? And it's a really good question. And we need more research in this area for sure, especially as we get more innovation in this space. We need to know what works well in which situations, which geographies, under which storm conditions. Um, but again, my colleague, um, Rachel Gitman has done some work on this. Again, as part of her dissertation, she wanted to look at how did bulkheads fare in comparison to living shorelines in North Carolina under a hurricane, I think it was category three. And so you see pictures here on the left of bulkheads that did not fare well after a category three hurricane. And then again, she was comparing to living shorelines. And what she found is that 76% of the bulkheads she studied in North Carolina were damaged or destroyed during this category three hurricane, whereas none of the living shorelines were destroyed. In some cases, she did note that there was a decrease in vegetative cover but by a year later, she couldn't even tell that there was a difference. So they had self-recovered after the hurricane and she couldn't tell that there'd been a storm a year before. So this is really good evidence that these hybrid solutions can function. I've got one more example for you here. So culverts are something that we're all familiar with and they aren't just a coastal phenomenon, but um, they, they are a huge part of our urban environment. And so what you're seeing on the left here is a very traditional culvert design. And unfortunately, when we get major events like big, big hurricanes or big nor'easters, um, the amount of water coming into these culverts is often enough to completely destroy them, like the one in the bottom picture here, where the water just pushed through the whole culvert and destroyed the road and just, just completely destroyed that whole thing. Now, um, this was a study done up in New England. Um, and what's really important to note is that when you destroy a culvert like this and the road is out, 
This actually makes it very hard for emergency people to reach a community, for people to leave that community, uh, to, to get back to their normal lives after the storm has passed. Um, so not only did we have a culvert failure, but we actually now have a critical barrier to having emergency services reach these people and then to just getting back to normal life. So we're comparing this normal culvert design, this traditional culvert design, to um, what we call the stream simulation ones. And so this is a culvert designed to simulate a stream. And what you can see is it has a much wider diameter that can handle a much larger amount of water. Um, and in, uh, in this study, again, in, New, in the New England area with Hurricane Irene, a, th a thousand traditional culverts were damaged, whereas none of the stream simulation ones were. So again, we have building evidence that these hybrid designs that mimic or work with nature are really much more resilient in the face of these extreme events. And remember, we already talked about climate change is likely to increase the number of events, increase the intensity of those events, or increase the amount of water being delivered in these events, right? So we're trending towards more extreme events. We need to be even more ready to handle them. Obviously, there's an additional benefit with this stream simulation simulated culvert in that this is much better habitat, stream habitat for fish and invertebrates, et cetera. So again, co-benefits here, besides the fact that this is more resilient to our extreme events. Okay, so another question I tend to get asked is, well, does is this cost effective? Aren't these going to be more expensive to build? The answer is, well, it depends. Um, but in this study that I did with my colleague, Rachel Gitman and some other colleagues, we did compare seawalls and bulkheads versus natural living shoreline designs. And what we found is that installation cost of the seawalls or bulkheads was generally far more expensive. Um, the low end of the seawall construction was the high end of the living shoreline construction cost. And then the annual maintenance was um, potentially higher um, and repair costs. Um, and, then, and then of course, um, the built infrastructure doesn't come with co-benefits, whereas the living shorelines can have some co-benefits for fishery production, et cetera. Um, another thing I want to mention is we've actually done some uh, interesting studies. There was a study done while I was at NOAA trying to ask if people care. Like, do people have a preference in what they might be looking at or what's in their neighborhood? And so this study, again, was done in the post-Superstorm uh, Sandy area of New York and New Jersey. And what we what um, what my colleague um, Nadu et al found was that respondents were willing to pay 3.3 to 4.7 times more for a living shoreline. So people actually prefer to look at a living shoreline than a seawall. Um, and it, and they use two different estimates here, so you, the details are not critical. But the the comparison was how much are you willing to pay for a living shoreline versus shoreline armoring like a seawall. And they were willing to pay substantially more. Now that's also paired with the fact that natural living shorelines oftentimes are cheaper to build, but people are actually willing to pay even more, potentially because they like the looks of them better. So building evidence that these, these natural and hybrid infrastructure opportunities have a, a really important place in society perhaps. Okay, um, I'm getting near the end, um, but I wanted to bring up some research by a couple of my colleagues, um, including uh, this one here, Enright et al. from 2016. So they did a very interesting study in the in the Gulf, and and what I want to make clear is um, there are there are times where natural and hybrid infrastructure isn't necessarily going to work well, right? And so um, if you're looking in the in the bottom figure here, for example, you've got mangrove with a big barrier wall behind it. And because of that barrier wall, if we have increased sea level rise, there's no place for that mangrove to migrate to. Um, basically, that wall is going to be all that's protecting whatever community is behind it. Same thing goes for the one right above it. If you've got a little bit of uh, marsh and then you've got a city, um, if sea level rise happens, that marsh is probably going to drown. It has no place to migrate inland, no place to move. You're just going to have more flooding in that city, right? So uh, these are cases where potentially natural infrastructure solutions, at least especially if you want them to be long-term, are going to be harder to do. Um, the next case up shows mangrove with an actual geologic feature behind it that makes it very hard for the mangrove to move inland. So again, we might lose those ecosystems with sea level rise because there's no place for them to move just due to the geology. So 
The top figure shows you where wetlands currently exist and with sea level rise, they might have a chance to move inland and continue to provide the really important, um, all, the, all the really important wetland benefits that, um, that these systems are providing. Now, the reason I bring this up though, is that um, if, you can, if you think about that top figure and then the third one down with the city, there are places where we have coastal urban growth planned, but we haven't built the city yet. And so there are places where it might currently look like the top picture, but we're then thinking of putting city where that wetland might be able to migrate, which would then put that city at much greater risk of flooding in the future. And so that's exactly what they, they then mapped in their study was they looked all along the Gulf Coast and they said, where is sea level rise going to likely have the biggest impact? And then they also said, where have we got planned development that if we thought about it now and didn't put that development in, we would be able to prevent there being uh, less wetland migration and more flooding in the future. And so basically they found areas, which you're seeing in the map on the right here, are areas where if the, the, ho the hotter color were places where if we made smarter urban decisions and planning right now, we could prevent future flooding by making sure there was a chance for wetlands to move inland and not be impeded by city that then would be at risk of flooding. So we have a choice right now, not just about what's already in place, the, the communities we're trying to protect, but how we continue to grow those communities and what they look like in the future. And we can be planning for more coastal wetland if we make smart planning decisions in our cities and our urban planning right now. Okay, so there are definitely still research needs here. You know, I, I can't give a research talk and not end with what are the continuing research needs, right? So one of the things we need is to better understand how do these natural and hybrid systems actually provide storm risk reduction. Um, we also need to understand the co-benefits of that. So the fisheries and the carbon and the recreation and all of those things I mentioned, we wanna know how, what are those worth? Because that all can then be part of a cost benefit analysis to help communities decide what kind of infrastructure do they wanna invest in as they're trying to be more resilient in the future. We need best practices for design, which is what you guys are working on. It's very exciting. And this should be a multidisciplinary effort. You got you to involve the engineers and the landscape architects and the planners and the ecologists and the environmental scientists and bring us all together and say, what might work here and why do we think it might work? And let's try it. Then we need to study how well it worked. And then there's an implementation gap here still. It is actually still ha harder to get a, a permit, for example, to put in a living shoreline than it is to put in a seawall. And that's because we've been doing seawalls for decades and decades, and it often can take you a day or two to get a, a permit for a seawall. And it's likely to take more like weeks or months to get a permit for a living shoreline. There have been strides to improve that. We have a nationwide living shorelines permit that the Army Corps has put forward. Um, but there's still some, some necessary policy adjustments to actually make it so that green infrastructure and gray infrastructure are on a level footing when it comes to implementation. So there's work yet there to be done. Um, I wanted to mention I've been working with some colleagues at George Mason University specifically on measuring wave attenuation and how does the water flow across this uh, very small beach and then wetland area out on Deal Island in uh, the Chesapeake Bay. So this is ongoing work. We have some of our first publications that we're trying to get out. Um, I believe that this video was one that was shared with the class. Um, the Audubon Society put together a, resili a, re a coastal resilience video, and then they did a briefing um, for on Capitol Hill about this, and I was one of the people interviewed in the video. One of the things I want to point out is we already have some very good policy tools available um, for continuing to protect these vulnerable coastal habitats that provide this important wave attenuation benefit, but that otherwise might get developed. Um, and so one of those tools is the Coastal Barriers Resources Act, CBRA. And what you see here in these two pictures on the right is that um, this is a New Jersey CBRA unit and then a Florida one. So what happens if, if you put land into the Coastal Barriers Resources Act is that you may not receive federal funds to develop that land. So you can't get any federal funds to build roads, to put in septic systems, to bring power to that area. You can't get any federal funds. So even though these two units are not explicitly 
conservation units, right? They haven't been put into an easement or they're not a part of a park or any other kind of specific conservation effort. Because they're in the Coastal Barriers Resources system, they've been, they've been put in that system because they provide the important coastal barrier protection. Um, they haven't been developed because it's far too expensive for companies to develop something if they can't get federal funding to help make that happen. And so this is a tool that I don't know that we have leveraged nearly enough to be able to protect more of these really important coastal barrier ecosystems that can provide protection to people. And then of course we need to be investing in restoration and protection of additional habitats as well. Um, okay, I'm almost near the end here. I wanted to flag that there are actually international, uh, NNBF stands for natural and nature-based features guidance um, that's going to be coming out in 2021. I don't think it's out yet, although I haven't checked the website really recently to see if the full guidance is out yet. This is guidance that was put together for engineers by engineers and ecologists and landscape architects and policymakers. So it had a whole bunch of people writing it, but really trying to help engineers understand what do we know about how these systems function and what works well where because there are already guidelines like this for gray infrastructure. You know, how do you build a seawall? How high do you need to build it for this kind of wave energy, et cetera, right? And we're trying to level the playing field and provide something similar for green infrastructure to start to help engineers feel like they have the tools to be figuring out where to implement engineering with nature as an opportunity. So this is very exciting. This has been many years in the making. This thing is going to be a huge tome. Um, but again, an important step forward for starting to make it possible to make um, everyone more aware of and potentially able to use these green or natural tools. So um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to end there. I'm really happy to take questions, but I want to leave you with a thought, which is that we have a lot of information now. We have a lot of tools they're developing. It is really up to us to decide what do we want the future of our coast to look like? Do we want it to look like giant seawalls or other riprap, et cetera? Or do we want it to look like something else? Because the power is in our hands to design that future now. Great. And then here is my email address and uh, there's my website. And I have uh, my, uh, basically all my pubs are at that website. Many of them are open access, but if there's something you want that you can't get to, you just have to shoot me an email and I'd be happy to share it with you. And with that, I'm happy to take questions. Okay. We're going to change it so that everybody can unmute themselves to ask questions if they'd like to. Um, but also you can type your question into the chat if you want. I'm going to be first just to say thank you. That was an extremely interesting um, presentation, covered a lot of ground. And hopefully everybody's just absorbing all this and ready to hit you with some questions, which I see maybe starting to pop up on the, on the chat. Yeah, we have our first question. Um, to start off with thanks, that was a great presentation. Um, and they want to know how often the natural solutions such as living shorelines should be maintained. Yeah, so um, many of these systems are designed such that they don't need much maintenance at all. Although again, it will depend a little bit on the design of the actual system and also um, how long do these systems have to establish before they get hit by their first big storm? If you just put in a living shoreline and are unfortunate enough to have a major hurricane happen that year, you may need to go back in and check out how is it doing? Did, you know, did the propagules, the plant propagules get washed away? Do we need to do some replanting? Um, you know, how did the rock weirs or whatever else fare? So some of it is, is just really dependent on what you build and what the, the timing is of the first major stressor. But to the point uh, of the study I, I mentioned earlier by my colleague, Rachel Gitman, she found that living shorelines in North Carolina under a category three hurricane, which I recognize is not as strong as they come, but under a category three hurricane, the living shorelines fared very well and they didn't get any actual maintenance. Nobody went in and replanted or anything like that. And a year later, the vegetation had all grown back and she couldn't even tell that there'd been a hurricane. So, so the answer may be very little, 
um, at least in some cases, but it, it, again, it does depend, um, on, on exactly what happened. Um, I mean, you could, and it, so if we take that culvert example, I showed with the stream simulation culvert, you know, if, if major trees get washed downstream after a really big event, you might need to go in and make sure you were removing major trees. So they weren't blocking parts of the culvert entrance. Um, so, you know, again, it's just going to depend on um, what kind of storm events you're getting, what kind of impacts to the landscape happened. Uh, but the, the ideal is that in many cases, these won't need much maintenance at all. Okay, and our next question. Um, sorry, hold on just a second. No problem. Uh, how do failed gray infrastructure projects impact future green infrastructure projects in the same area? Yeah, that's a really good question. So I didn't talk about it, but my colleague Rachel Gitman did actually do some surveys of people in North Carolina. After she had her results, she went to some of the landowners and showed them the results about that 76% of bulkheads had failed and that um, the living shorelines had not failed. Um, and then she asked them, so, you know, what might you do in the future? And interestingly, most of them said, well, I'm just going to rebuild my bulkhead. Um, and, um, and then there was another study in the Chesapeake Bay that found that people preferred to have built infrastructure on their land, but they preferred to look at more natural living shorelines or other nature uh, across from them. So they'd like it if all their neighbors used the living shorelines approaches, for example, but they maybe still preferred to go with the built. I think what we're facing is um, just a, a general need to slowly educate and to show people the evidence and also to just get people used to what does it look like when we do something different in our coastal environment? People are so used to just having the hardened shoreline, the seawalls, the bulkheads everywhere, that something that looks different um, just feels a little uncomfortable for people. So. Um, so, but I do think that where we have failures in, in hard infrastructure is a perfect place to start having the conversation about, are you just going to rebuild again exactly the same way? But it failed. So isn't it likely to just fail again in the next big storm? And so what else could we be doing and what might those solutions look like? And we need to find those early adopters who are all excited to do something new and different and take them up on that willingness and then study what happens and continue to build our evidence base and continue to build our examples and slowly start to shift that baseline of what does a normal coast look like when we've protected it and made it more resilient? What does that look like? I think that if more places looked like those visions of what New York City could look like if we restored all the oyster reefs and had floating wetlands and other things in the in the in the bay, um, it would feel a lot less like just a picture of the future and more like, hey, this can actually happen and this is happening in my community. So it's just going to take time to kind of shift people's views of this. Um, but I do see a lot of hope here, like the, the Superstorm Sandy region that was um, studied by my colleague Lou Nadeau that I mentioned, where people are willing to pay more for the green opportunity in some cases. And so again, we got we to gotta go where there's fertile ground and work with those people and start to shift the current pattern, which is where it's urbanized, we just harden the heck out of the shorelines. So our next question is about the existing data um, and if there's any resources for exploring existing resilience projects like a database that's our, that's already exists or if that's something that needs to be built? Yeah, so I don't immediately know of a database that would have all the projects. Um, I mean, the so the Maryland state government has funded a bunch of living shorelines projects and I think you can find out some more about those on the website, but even then they aren't because of privacy concerns, they're not sharing locations specifically, et cetera. Although the person who works on this for the state of Maryland loves to give tours. So if anybody wants to go on a field trip out into Maryland, he loves to give tours of all of his different project sites. That's how I learned so much. It was, a, it was an amazing day. Um, I think that that, um, that book I mentioned that's gonna be the um, NNBF big engineering tome is gonna have a lot of examples of projects in it. Um, so when that comes online in 2021, I think that will be one place to go for some examples. But, um, but right now, as far as I know, there is no one big database where you can go for all of this. And um, that's, that's definitely potentially a limitation and, and a weakness. Um, and so it would be great to start figuring out where could we put that database, who would help maintain it, who would keep it up to date. The one problem with databases is they actually are a lot of work. 
um, to try and keep them up to date. And so um, that would be definitely an undertaking, but I think it's a great idea and I think it would be very useful. Okay, our next question, um, and thank you for answering these so thoroughly and well. Um, so this, the students said they're curious about the hybrid approach. Um, some of your infographics towards the end started to answer the question um, about barriers to the landward migration of marches, but they're also curious if you can speak to ways that gray infrastructure can limit the potential effectiveness and ecological benefits of nature-based approaches. Yeah, so um, I wanna be really upfront that I think that natural and nature-based features are really exciting and, um, and very innovative. However, they may only be buying us some time, something like a hundred years, maybe. Um, you know, it, we don't actually know how fast sea level rise is really going to occur and how cataclysmic it might come. But if we don't slow this down a great deal, which in my lifetime, I just haven't seen that yet, but I'm still very hopeful. We're working on it, but um, we may not be able to save a lot of coastal communities. Now, that doesn't mean they're gonna just disappear and die, but we're gonna have to get to that place societally where we are ready to consider migrating the community inland, right? The whole community. So what I see as the important part of natural and nature-based features is that it buys us some additional time to continue to, as a society, grapple with and understand sea level rise and all of the social and ecological and economic impacts and to start figuring out even, even longer term solutions, right? So in some places, depending on the geology, uh, we may be able to keep coastal communities roughly where they are if it tends to be already somewhat built up and not quite as directly impacted by sea level rise. But in many cases, we may be buying ourselves some time to figure out other even longer term solutions. Um, so I'm, I do not see this necessarily as a silver bullet. Um, I don't think with anything related to climate change, there is a silver bullet, or I think we might have already done it, right? So both in the mitigation and the adaptation side, there's not, there are not simple silver bullet solutions. These are complex social issues and environmental issues, socio-environmental issues that we need to tackle and we need to start tackling them now before we even probably have all the tools we want on the table. And here I'm starting to talk about, you know, not just what can we build infrastructure wise, but how can we get to a point where societally it becomes okay to think about moving communities and really making some big changes that I think are, are probably still coming all around the world and we're just not really quite ready to go there yet. Um, so I think it's a combination of a whole bunch of things, but, um, but I do have a lot of hope that we're gonna figure this out. We're very smart, and we're very smart species, maybe smarter than we should be, I don't know. But, um, but I think that um, these aren't necessarily the thousand year solution in some cases, right? This is maybe the hundred year or the 200 year solution that helps us get by some time to figure out what the thousand or 2000 year solution is. Okay, and the next question is kind of multi-part. So it's about the blue carbon benefits of coastal eco ecosystems and whether there's a difference in carbon sequestration between existing marshes or built and restored marshes. Um, if so, can designed can designing can you design restored marshes in a way that increases carbon capture? Um, also, smaller scale coastal eco ecosystems near urban environments. Um, do those work for carbon capture or do you need larger um, and more natural areas? Yeah, great question. So I'll tackle the last one first. My colleague, Carolyn Curran, who works at NOAA in North Carolina, actually studied a bunch of living shoreline projects in North Carolina. So these are like that one I pictured in Pivers Island where it was the small amount of beach that was eroding and then they put in the small strip of marsh. She studied, well, she's interested in their resilience benefit, of course, but she's also interested in the blue carbon benefit. And she actually looked at how much carbon is being taken up and stored in those small strips of living shorelines. And, and the answer is, when it comes to carbon sequestration, bigger is better. There is absolutely no doubt that you, the bigger the ecosystem, the more carbon it can sequester, because it's all about how much the plants can take up and then bury in the soil. And the soil is where the long, long-term storage is happening. 
And so a tiny strip of vegetation can only store carbon in that tiny strip of, of, of area. So the bigger you have, the more carbon you can store. But her paper basically pointed to if we did living shorelines along all the places on the coast where we're concerned about erosion, it would actually start to have a measurable carbon benefit because it would start to add up and become a bigger area, right? Um, so they all count, basically. Again, this comes back to my, this is a sliver of the solution, the sliver of the pie, if you will, and it all matters. But the smaller areas are not gonna sequester as much simply because there's not as much area. So to the other question about um, marshes and restored marshes. So, so there's two components that are really important to think about with blue carbon. The first, and I like to compare it to a bank account um, because that's something that most people can generally understand. So, so we have a carbon bank account in this case, in, this, in these ecosystems, right? So the first thing that matters is how much carbon or money is going into that bank account every year. So that's the annual sequestration. It's kind of like your paycheck or, you know, for students, it's your fellowship or your stipend and your paychecks and everything else you can cobble together, of course. Um, so it's all the money going into that account every year. That's the plant productivity every year. That's the plants taking the CO2 out of the atmosphere, photosynthesizing, and then storing a bunch of it below ground in the wet anaerobic environment where there's not much oxygen. And so the carbon gets in there and it stays in there. And that's what makes these such amazing places to store carbon is because they're anaerobic and they, and they, and it just, most of it just stays there. So there's a second part of a bank account, though, if you're thinking about it, that matters a great deal, right? And that's, do you have a savings account? Not just your checking, what's coming in every year, what's going out, pay the bills, et cetera, but what's in the long-term savings? And in these ecosystems, that carbon savings account, if you will, is that long-term sequestration in the, in the soil, the part that's already been there for decades or hundreds, and in the case of marshes in the Chesapeake Bay, thousands of years. That carbon has been accumulating slowly. Um, and these soils, the, the Chesapeake Bay, the, I did my postdoc at the Smithsonian Environmental Research Center. And at CERC, some of the marshes have been tested and they're five and six meters deep. And that soil is pretty organic rich all the way down. Um, so that's organic rich soil that's been accumulating for uh, those soils. They actually carbon dated them and they were um, between five and 6,000 years old. So the reason I bring that up is that when we talk about blue carbon, it's both what goes in annually, but it's also making sure we don't come along and disturb that old carbon that's been in these soils for a really long time. So we want to both keep the checking account open and we want to keep the savings account full. So this is where there's a difference between an old marsh and a newly restored marsh. The old marsh is going to have both a big savings account and the checking account. The new marsh is potentially going to have a much smaller savings account, maybe not even much savings account yet, but it will start to accumulate that savings account the longer it's in. Now, the one caveat to that is if you have a degraded marsh where, say, somebody decided to um, drain it and then build an apartment building or farm it for a couple decades, um, and now you've decided that you're going to restore it. You've probably lost some of the carbon out of that system because it was drained. And that means oxygen made its way into that soil and started to um, mineralize that, that carbon. And so some of it's been blown off as CO2. But whatever still remains, when you do that restoration, it will halt that oxidation. And so you will then basically avoid the loss of that carbon. So depending on where you're doing your restoration, my point is basically, if you're restoring on a fairly organic rich soil, you're going to avoid the loss of that organic rich soil and that's going to be really great and it's going to be an immediate benefit of that restoration. If you're restoring on a site that is not particularly organic rich, then you don't have a savings account yet, but give it a couple decades and you're going to start having a savings account. So it does kind of matter depending on what action you're taking and, and what the site history is. And that was kind of a long answer, but it felt like there were a lot of pieces there that needed to be addressed to give that kind of a clear answer. Thank you so much. That was really helpful. You're welcome. Okay, so our next question, how can we design restoration projects that will be sustainable in the future when the climate is different and supports different ecosystems? Is it premature to consider using plant species that are predicted to occur further north with climate change? Yeah, well, so that's a good question. Um, I can tell you that of the example I showed you in Maryland here, where they were planning for sea level rise, they actually did plant the plants uh, and they contoured the site with 
like something like eight or nine feet of sea level rise intended because they were thinking, okay, by 2100, this is likely to be this much higher. I don't think they changed what was being planted, but they changed how they designed the site and where they were going to even plant things. Um, so you can be thinking about that kind of stuff. Um, I think where that matters the most, for example, in Florida, we're already seeing the migration of mangroves up, mangroves up the Florida coast in places they didn't used to be because those places aren't freezing um, as much in the winter. And, and it's the freezing that really causes mangroves to not be able to move north. So there might be places in Florida where one could already be saying, well, there aren't mangroves really here yet, or we've seen only one little you know, tree that has started to grow here. But that suggests if we're doing a restoration here, we might wanna consider whether we wanna mix in some mangroves um, and whether that would be effective or not. Um, I think with plant communities, if we provide them the space and the connectivity to other healthy ecosystems, which is what living shorelines and other opportunities are going to do, right, is help to provide that connectivity, plants are going to migrate on their own. So I'm less concerned about do we need to plant right now, planning for 100 years into the future. What we need to do right now is make sure we don't obstruct that uh, dispersal by those plants. So we need to remove where possible culverts roads, other blockages that are making it very difficult for wetlands to move inland or wetlands to move up the coast. We need to make any existing wetland, if possible, we need to remove the barriers to its inland migration, if that's possible. It may get be too, too prohibitively expensive in some cases, but where we can remove barriers or make sure that new barriers are not built. That will probably be our strongest way of protecting these ecosystems into the future. And then they will continue to develop and disperse as climate changes. Sorry, I muted myself. Thanks. Uh, so the no next question is, um, are there gray infrastructures that can provide comparable benefits to green infrastructure at reduced cost? Well, so I don't quite know what is meant by comparable benefits, but um, I mean, I can tell you there's some experimentation going on with can we, for example, develop seawalls that are designed and shaped to look more like a natural reef so that they will be able to actually be habitat for a few sessile creatures that might, you know, decide to live on that habitat. I think that's kind of interesting, um, but there's really nothing that a concrete wall can provide in the same way that a wetland can provide it. So I, I think it gets very difficult to say comparable benefits. Now, um, except when you're talking about storm risk reduction and, and you know, then, then gray infrastructure does a really good job of slowing down waves and, and things like that. Although, you know, they get overtopped and once the overtopping happens, if they're really, you know, that big a wave, that's, that's, you know, that's it. Water has gotten beyond them. Um, but so I would really say that it's very difficult to, to compare the co-benefits in particular, because gray infrastructure just really does not provide the same kinds of co-benefits that you get from the natural or hybrid opportunities. However, this is a space for innovation. I mean, when I read the article about the concrete that they were trying to make more like a reef-like system, I was like, well, that's that's creative. So, you know, there, there could be more there that we just haven't thought of yet. Um, but I think it is very hard to get concrete to be anything like a wetland. And our next question is from Jack. So I don't know if he wants to read it himself or if you'd like me to read it. Well, I, I'll go ahead and read it, but it's probably easier for me just to say it versus trying to read what I wrote. Uh, my question is really one, this is kind of a social question. We'd been discussing it a little bit in class before your presentation, was this idea when you start doing living shorelines and salt marshes, you start restricting access to those beach areas. And a lot of the public areas serve more of the underserved communities, whereas the private beaches tend to be people of means, you know, they're, or communities of means. So I was wondering if there's any studies done about kind of those trade-offs to these communities. If they're, are they losing access to an asset that they only get because it's a public asset and the trade-offs of protecting 
um, the communities from sea level rise versus the loss of access from somebody that's only getting access to the water through these, these areas? Yeah. I don't immediately know of a study exactly like that, but I have a couple thoughts. Um, first of all, I grew up in Oregon where all the beaches are publicly accessible. You cannot have a private beach. So when I moved away from Oregon, it was a huge shocker to learn that that wasn't the way it was in all the other states. I mean, I literally was like, what? So that's been an adjustment for me after I came out of my naive young life. Um, you know, most of the living shorelines projects I have seen have been on private lands. So for example, the ones that the state of Maryland has done have been with willing partners on private lands in almost all cases. Um, so I don't immediately, I am less familiar. And like the NOAA example, that's NOAA property that they did the living shoreline on. So it was already private property. I don't know if there are uh, good examples of where it used to be open and now because of the living shoreline, it's not. In the cases of all the projects I have visited, they were already private property and they aren't open to the public. Um, I could see that potentially being a challenge. However, in the example of the Big U project and some of the other ones that came out of the Rebuild by Design competition, one of the important parts of that competition was that the community needed to be involved and they needed to do stakeholder engagement and figure out what the community was hoping for in, in terms of um, as they continued to move forward with coastal resilience strategies. And so basically all the examples I saw come out of that project were places where they were actually aiming to get more recreational opportunity, more access for the public and not less. And I think that that is very possible as long as you go into a project designing that way and involving the public and taking input. Now, does stakeholder engagement make things more complicated? Absolutely. Is everyone gonna agree? Uh, maybe, but highly unlikely, right? So it does make it more complicated, but it also hopefully gets you to a place where more people are bought in, more people have a chance to have input into the ideas and into the potential solutions. You might come up with even better ideas because you brought a group together to think about it. And definitely issues of equity, which are very important in the Biden administration right now. So there's going to be lots of willing ears to talk about and think about how do we make sure that equitable outcomes are happening for people. Um, I think it's a really good time to be thinking about how do we make sure these projects are not making it harder for people to access these sites, but instead are hopefully increasing recreational opportunities at the same time that we're increasing resilience. I think that's very doable and really hopeful. Yeah, the, I think also flipping that around a little bit, is this another um, environmental justice kind of issue that what are we doing? We're, we're going very we're investing a lot of resources to protect these private properties instead of using it to protect public, which is more accessible usually by a lower income uh, type. So that's, that's just been something that I've been looking at from even green infrastructure in cities is the fact that we tend to put it not where it's necessarily most needed, which is in the underserved communities, which are almost 100% impervious. We tend to put them in communities that already have green space. And, and so that was just kind of an open question. Have we been thinking about those aspects of what we're doing or anything's better than nothing? Let's take what we can get and let's start restoring shorelines where we can do it. Well, and I can tell you that Deal Island project I mentioned um, that I was working on with colleagues at George Mason, um, we also had colleagues at the Maryland Department of Natural Resources. And um, the whole idea was to better understand the flooding dynamics that's, that's um, right in front of this Deal Island community right there, and to help inform with our studies of how was the water moving, how was the flooding occurring, um, to, to actually help to Im inform Maryland Department of Natural Resources decisions on future projects they want to invest in, in terms of resilience projects. So, um, so the community in that case was a big driver in us selecting Deal Island as a place we were going to do our study. And so again, I think that those with the decision power and the money for projects, et cetera, can really drive this by saying something like, we aren't even going to consider your project unless you have talked to the community, done stakeholder engagement and thought about equity issues, right? So if you make the baseline that this has to be part of it, 
then we can get there. But that sometimes has to be very top-down driven to, to just make that part of the process. Okay, I'm not seeing any more questions in the chat. Um, it's 625, so I, I think we have time for one last question, if that's okay. Um, that's fine, and I'll just say that if people have questions later where they have a brainstorm in the middle of the night or whatever, um, they can feel free to email me. And then I know Jack was also talking about trying to possibly have each of the presenters be available to the students in some way throughout the semester. So I can't promise I'm going to be on every Monday, but um, I would be happy to try to be available either at a particular time or for a subset of students to talk to me or, or something like that. So it's not like this is your only chance to ask a question. Does anybody have one last question? I might've worn everybody out. I tend to do that to people. Well, it was really great information. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. This was great. And I wish you all luck as you're designing away. And I can't wait to be more involved in how that turns out and to see what you guys come up with. So I'm very excited. You are invited back. And especially as we start reviewing and I'm sure um, you will get uh, questions and you're Input is more than more than welcome to the semester. This is a great way to kick off this series, and uh, you know we're looking forward to more. And we just thank you so much for you know for your um, for all your thoughts, the questions. You did a great job of answering questions, and I'm sure thank I'm you. Sure